The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts, this is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And the show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron. My pleasure to introduce our guest tonight. First up, please welcome back a favorite freelance gun journalist covering industry news, products, and reviews, and also serves as Instagram's favorite micro-warrior, Jackie Billings. Welcome back. Hey, guys. Next up, we've got a newbie to the show. She's a podcaster at Not Your Average Gun Girls, host of Noir, Gun TV, and creator of Alexo Athletica, Amy Robbins. Welcome to the show. Former host of Noir <laughs> and Gun TV, but I will take it. How's it going, guys? Great to be here tonight. Glad to have you both. Super, super excited. Before we get into everything, I just want to remind our listeners, go to Patriot Patch Co. and sign up for the Patch of the Month Club. That's patriotpatch.co. Awesome patches, shirts, and all kinds of other stuff. And let's get right into it. Uh, you know, we're going to start big here. Springfield Armory makes several of their guns better by adding color. Uh, this comes to us from the Outdoor Wire. I've seen it covered in a lot of different places, but they basically released a bunch of different configurations of, what is it, their 380 and their 9 mil, and they changed the colors and things like that. Ladies, does it matter? Jackie, I'll start with you. Well, I mean, I guess it matters if you like colors on your gun. <laughs> uh, um, you know, I see this. I think this has definitely been a trend we've been seeing in the gun industry where Companies are now offering colors so that people don't have to go get things Cerakoted or send their guns off. So it's cool if you like Springfield, but you don't want to drop dough on a Cerakote job, then you've got an out-of-the-box option. Uh, it seems like they've gotten a lot of colors together, too, so it's not just your usual, you know, FDE and black. So, you know, <laughs> if you like Springfield, go for it. Amy? Well, I think there's been this interesting trend in the market where... Gun companies, especially as they're trying to bring more women into into the firearms industry, right? And so we've, we've started to see all these new colors and all these things. And I think on one hand, I like it uh, because I think that the options are great. I personally have one of the the nine one ones, the nine. But, um, that's one of my favorite options when I'm running and I got it in the nitride and then I don't even know what color it is on the grip. Cool grip. The bad, the downside to it that I, I think that we see a lot of times too is that the gun industry sometimes just wants to slap a color on a gun and be like, Ooh, here you go, women. Here's our pretty firearm that we made. Isn't this the one that you want? And you know, I, I, I try to do this fun experiment sometime where I'll walk into gun stores and I just want to see what gun they pick out for me. And of course they always like direct me over to the pink firearms. You know, I have no problem with pink firearms, but it's not what I personally would choose. I think that we have a long way to go to bring women into the industry other than just like slapping colors on our firearms. But I, I'm not going to fault Springfield for it. I think it's cool. Um, there was a pretty the vintage blue. Yeah. All kinds of other colors too. And I think it's a good little gun anyway. So check it out. Definitely. All right. I think we covered that one. Next one's kind of a freaky one. Lakemore police officer wrestles with gun wielding murder suspect partner shoots him in the head. So this video is actually pretty interesting to watch. Yeah. It comes um, to us. Holy cow. <laughs> I know. That's exactly my response as well. So she's, she's there. She sees him draw a firearm. She uh, grabs, grabs the gun and, and starts screaming. And a lot of people were criticizing that. I think it was a good way to get her partner over there. He, he rolls up takes aim shoots and the the threat stops it was absolutely nuts amy what do you think where the heck was her partner is my question it took 22 seconds or something for him to get in there i don't know the situation all you see are the perspective of the the, you got the dash cam you've got her body cam then you've got the camera of the police officer and warning don't watch this video if you have a weak stomach. I mean, like it's, it's very intense. Yeah. Um, the screams alone from this lady were extremely intense and it was very frightening, but I just, I didn't understand where, where was the backup partner? And there was a lot that seemed to happen in that video that I, you know, I don't have a law enforcement background. I cannot speak to their procedures and their protocols or anything like that, but oh my gosh, that was terrifying. And it shows you very quickly how like something like a routine 
traffic stop can turn deadly very quickly for our law enforcement officers. And honestly, my heart just goes out to all of them because that's a terrifying reality that they face every single day. Yeah. And for the armchair quarterbacks that are talking about her screaming, yelling, whatever it happens to be like, shut up, dude, unless you've been in it. I don't even want to hear about it. Jackie, what do you think? Yeah, I I think that's what bothered me the most was reading the comments and seeing people armchair quarterback. And it's like, unless you've been face to face with a with a gun, you have no idea how you're going to react. And she was trying to get her partner over there to help her. Uh, I'm glad that the officers were not harmed. But it is a good reminder of all the things that our law enforcement face every day that we don't even think about. So, you know, kudos to them. I also think from a civilian perspective, it's good to to watch these and analyze these and realize how quickly situations can evolve from just talking to someone regularly to having a gun pulled on you. So, you know, I think for a civilian takeaway is, you know, it's not a square range. Things happen very quickly and you've got to make very quick choices in how to proceed. And if we could just talk real quick about that awesome headshot that the partner took. Yes. It was amazing. I'm like that the fact that he got over there, got one shot off and it was exactly what they was needed to eliminate the threat was just awesome. So thank God for he's been getting out and doing some training. So that that was awesome. It it was good. I I, I was really impressed by that. And I was glad that uh, neither officer was hurt and the bad guy got what the bad guy got. Yep. Ninth Circuit, our favorite, rules that illegals have no right to own guns. This is kind of surprising, but federal court made the decision on the ability of illegal immigrants to carry firearms. So this is a guy that basically came over illegal with uh, illegally with his parents in like 2005, uh, got kicked out of school, was sent back to Mexico, came back over to the United States illegally once again, and uh, was selling bikes, got caught, had a gun, bolt cutters, and what appeared to be two homemade silencers. Went to court and did everything, and he said, well, this is an infringement of my right, uh, of my Second Amendment rights. Uh, They took it in. They appealed it all the way up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said, no, I don't think that that's going to work. Uh, He he did. He claimed that the federal law violated his Second Amendment right to possess firearms. The appeals court in their judgment said, while it's unclear whether undocumented immigrants have Second Amendment rights, the law banning gun possession by that group is a valid exercise of Congress's authority. So this one, it's an interesting – Judgment from the Ninth Circuit and very interesting to kind of see where this one goes from there. Jackie, what do you think? Yeah, it was very interesting, especially coming out of the Ninth Circuit. But I I agree with their decision that the Constitution covers legal U.S. residents, but not I- illegal immigrants. You know, that's the benefit and a perk of, of getting legal residency is getting that Second Amendment protection. So kudos, I guess, for making the right call on that one. Yeah. Amy? Yeah, well, and kudos for taking it on and even deciding that they were going to take this on. You know, obviously, the political environment right now is very sensitive, and um, I am I just applaud them for even getting it all the way up there and then making the ruling that they did because, you know, at the end of the day, law-abiding citizens are the ones that get rewarded by getting to possess their firearms. You know, we take away the rights of felons in this this country, so why should someone who's here illegally get – the same rights as our law abiding citizens. So, you know, I, I agree with Jackie that that's a perk. Go get legal, do this the right way. Uh, we want you here. Um, if you're going to abide by our laws and uh, we want you here. So that's a perk. If you want to carry a firearm, do it the right way. Yeah. Just like all of us have to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the things that confused me was they said, while it is unclear uh, whether undocumented immigrants have second amendment rights, blah, blah, blah. And I just thought that was a very interesting way to phrase something. And it makes me wonder what's, is this going to be taken up by the Supreme Court uh, because of that that wording or, you know, a point that his defense attorney made? I just I thought it was really interesting to put in there that exact verbiage. And I guess maybe I personally haven't heard anything about it being a question whether undocumented or illegal aliens have the right to the Second Amendment. Uh, have you guys heard anything about that? I haven't yeah. heard it specifically in regards to that, but I just guess I've always assumed that if you're not a legal U.S. citizen, you're not entitled to our rights. And maybe that's just naivety on my part. I I I, I just don't know, but I've always just assumed you're a legal U.S. citizen and then you get our rights. If you're not, you don't get our rights, but the lines are blurred these days. Yeah. I was, I was really confused. I was like, wait, how is it? Is this a thing? (laughs) Do I need to be uh, mad about this now? Like, I don't even, I don't even know. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, so good job, Ninth Circuit. I'm glad you earned, earned your paycheck this time. Wyoming bill would repeal many gun-free zones. 
This comes to us from the Star Tribune. And basically, a Senate bill has been been introduced that would uh, basically repeal a lot of gun-free zones across the state. Uh, the person who put it in said that he was seeing a lot of gun-free zones across the United States and just wanted to protect its rights for their citizens. I think that, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty good. Uh, you know, they they would allow them in schools. It wouldn't preempt private property rights or anything like that. And they would leave it to the states or to the cities and towns in the state to actually decide whether that uh, extended to the local government buildings and things like that, which I think is kind of how, how everything really should work. Uh, Amy, what do you think? Um, you know, when I first read the headline of that, my number one question was, okay, is this going to circumvent uh, private property rights and all that? And as I read further and they did answer that question. And I mean, I'm off, I'm all for it. I'm, I am all for, um, we, we see these mass shootings. We see these people that go in and, and shoot up things when they're not stopped by somebody else that has a firearm. So to me, gun free zones are just nothing else than big flashing red signs that say, come here and shoot this area up because law abiding citizens aren't going to be there to defend themselves. And and so I am all for getting rid of um, gun-free zones and encouraging more law-abiding citizens to to get the training that they need, to carry lawfully, to carry safely, um, because I do think that that would deter a lot of problems that – that we're seeing these days. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. I don't see a downside to it to be completely honest. Yeah. Same Jackie. Uh, yeah, I don't either. I think this is a, a great measure put forth by Wyoming. And I think it's also, I, I think it's a good medium allowing individual cities to determine, you know, their own buildings. I think that's, that's a good middle ground. That's saying, you know, we recognize that there may be cities that aren't you know, okay with this and we're giving them the, the opportunity to kind of do what they want. But, you know, I, I've never thought that, that, that it's a bad idea. If you're trained and you can legally carry, why can't you basically everywhere you can? You know, I get that federal laws prohibit certain areas. Um, and we all have to abide by that. But, you know, it's, as Amy said, with, with the, mass shootings that are going on and things like that, you know, I, I would appreciate having someone else there with a gun, you know, that could, could back me up or could help me if I can't get to mine. So I think it's a great, a great thing. Yeah. Good stuff. And the bill would also clarify that only the Wyoming legislature may regulate firearms, weapons, and ammunition, therefore overriding local ordinances. So they're given a little, taking a little back for the state and, you know, good for them. Next story. This one I thought was kind of funny. Uh, I just put it in because it, it made me laugh a little bit. Oklahoma woman brags on dating app about poaching a deer to man who happens to be a game warden. Uh, they were on Bumble. They were talking back and forth. She said uh, that she had bagged a deer using a spotlight at night outside the season, only harvested the head and the backstrap meat, and then sent this guy on a dating app pictures of proof. Anyway, she pleaded guilty to charges of improper possession of an illegally taken animal and taking game out of season. She and an accomplice face twenty four hundred dollars in fines. Uh, Jackie, you've wrote some articles about dating apps and things. Uh, <laughs> let's hear your thoughts. <laughs> I know it's ironic that we're doing this tonight while I'm here. I know, so um, weird. Well, I mean, you know, dating's hard. I'm gonna give her that. It's hard on these apps, and you you got to stand out. And I guess that's one way to do it. But this is, I think, a case of uh, know your audience, do a little Google research. Everybody Google's everybody. Like, see who you're talking to, because bragging about illegal activities to the authorities is not going to get you a date. It's going to get you a date to jail. I mean, if you're going to have some coffee behind bars, that's cool, I guess. <laughs> right. But. Yeah, this was just one of those, like, really? This is, like, is this real life? <laughs> this I, I, happened? I couldn't believe it. I was like, hey, maybe don't admit to crimes with people you don't know. Right. It's maybe. Know yeah, good rule of, good rule of thumb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I it was been so long. I can't remember the last time I've tried. I mean, I've been married now for 12 years, and I'm like, I don't remember the last thing I used to, like, impress a guy. But, you know, she she pulled out all the stops on this one, even sending pictures of it and everything. I mean, she, yeah. She's going to get a date. She, she's like, you want some of this backstrap? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't it's, go. It's sending I pictures. I was like, oh, God, the outcome of that is really about as unfortunate as sending like an inappropriate selfie to the wrong phone number. You know, I mean, I just don't think you want the repercussions of bragging about illegally poaching a deer. Um, but man, she was just really trying to do what she could to stand out. <laughs> right. She went for it. With the end of the day, we can say she went for it. <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> uh, and she's like, backstrap was a euphemism. Let me out. 
All right. Well, what did she do with the rest of the meat? Yeah, I just left it apparently. Jeez. Uh, but, but like, why? I, I mean, like, that's the funniest. And, and the head, she, what, she harvested the head and yeah. the back strap. I'm like, well, I mean, she clearly didn't need it. She was just like, oh, hey, what's up? And then she's like, well, <laughs> I'll take a little bit of meat, but not all of it. She's like offering to cook his next meal, like with whatever <laughs> food she, she harvested. I love it. Hey, this next story, not your average gun girls will be making a splash at the 2019 shot show. Uh, Amy, do you know anything about this? I heard something about that the other day. <laughs> well, tell uh, us all about I, it. I think I got a, a recoil web update telling me some not your average gun girls were going to be there or something. Uh, no, we're really, really excited about shot show this year. You know, last year we launched at shot show. We, we recorded about nine episodes last year. We're on track to do about the same this year. And what's really been fun about the podcast is just how it's evolved. You know, we kind of first started out, uh, just wanting to talk about, talk to different women within the industry and then also women that had nothing to do with the gun industry that just happened to be your everyday average soccer moms. We had soccer moms on the show who love to bake and go to swing classes. And then they just happened to be on the HK shooting team. You know, yeah. we really wanted to highlight all the lights women possibly could. And then we started bringing in some really non-average gun girls on the show when we opened it up to uh, having some men on the show. So <laughs> the men have Even been better. great. They they bring a lot of, yeah, Sean, we can have you on the show if you want to come on the Not Your Average Gun Girl show. We actually have I, I several in. guys lined up. I'm in. Sk- pencil me in. Let's do it. I, Let's do it. I, I, you got a pen in your hand. Write it down. Otherwise, we'll I, all forget. I'm writing, I'm writing this down <laughs> with a lot of takeaways that you've given me tonight. So that's awesome. Um, so, but no, we're really excited about it. We've got, um, we've got Jack Carr, the author of the Terminal List, a uh, former Navy SEAL, really great. His uh, book was on the New York Times bestseller list, which is awesome. We're in talks with some like really cool former CIA guys, great trainers, um, to get the training perspective. And then of course we've got, um, the, the women we're, we've got lots of women that are coming on the show that we're really excited about. So Jackie, I know I'm going to, we should pencil you in too. If you're, if you're going to be running around shot show, but we'd love to have you on as well. So. so I did listen to some of your content from last year and it actually went really good for you guys. You guys did a fantastic job. Now it, I, Thank I have you. done the same thing like at shot show where I recorded podcasts, but uh, my podcast is really just known for clowning around being stupid idiots. So it didn't work for us. Like I was like, Oh, we should actually know what we're talking about and be professional. Well, okay. Well, you guys, yours is very timely too. It's called this week in guns. <laughs> I would think that you have to be very timely with your message. Oh yeah. We can kind of spread out our content for a while. Well, and on this one, you know, I'm, I have to be respectable. It's my other show. We like shooting that, that is, you know, we're crazy and, and stupid and don't do anything right. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, this is super awesome. Uh, where, where are you guys going to be? Where are you going to be set up? So we're all over. We have the official, like the full schedule, um, at recoil web. If you just Google recoil web, not your average gun girl, they listed out exactly what booth my, I'm like, my schedule is all over the place. And I, if I tried to tell you where I was going to be in what days that would, I would steer you the wrong direction, but we're going to be like the SIG booth one day, full conceal ETS, elite tactical systems, um, Aguila ammo, stealth gear, uh, taser defense. I mean, we're kind of all over the place. So, um, it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. And if you get to come to shot show and you want to come by and see a live recording, feel free to hop on and look at the schedule and come say hi. Very cool. Jackie, anything on this one? Uh, I think it's awesome. I've listened to the podcast and I love that it's representing regular women. They talk about makeup because I shop at Sephora as much as I go to the gun store. So I'm like, yes, I need lipstick recommendations. Um, I'm so glad you said that because now that we, we've kind of, we've slacked on our uh, makeup recommendations and I'm like, we're bringing that back for mm-hmm. Shasha. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. But no, I think it's great because not every woman in this industry I mean, it's great to have Ellie and military and much respect to those women and the tactically focused women. Any woman in the industry is amazing. But there are a lot of us who I like to call myself a target mom. You know, like I want to hear I want to, you know, hear and be represented by women who, you know, do other things other than just guns. It's cool. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you. And I, I appreciate that because uh, you're like our target audience. You know, we are exactly who we were, were going after. I joke now because I'm like as many, we started this because we thought we were like not your average gun girls, but we're figuring out that there's a lot of women like us. So we yep. might have to change the name of the show to the average gun girls. Absolutely. <laughs> average. <Yeah. laughs> Absolutely love it. Uh, very excited to see what you guys do. 
Uh, this next story, this one is, this one is an interesting one for me. Uh, it, it stinks because I, I actually don't like the guy, but then also I think it might be just a little bit ridiculous. Co-owner of Utah Gun Exchange arrested for weapons violations and marijuana possession. Uh, this is, uh, one of the guys who was a founder and co-owner, uh, basically got a, a warrant served on his house and he had a large amount of marijuana and cash, uh, you know, victim free crimes. I'm not sure that that's necessarily, I'm not sure exactly what everything was going on about. But it's definitely a black eye for the gun industry, I, I, I do believe. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Jackie, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, this one kind of was hard for me or weird because I don't feel like I had all the facts that I would want to in order to make a clear judgment on this. But, I mean, it definitely isn't great for the gun industry because I think the the anti-gun community is always looking for ways to paint us in a negative light or say, oh, look, they're the bad guys. They're really the bad guys. Mm-hmm. And anytime one of us does something that is illegal in in whatever manner, whether it's, I mean, it's marijuana. But regardless, right. <laughs> regardless, it, you know, it's still illegal by, by law. So, you know, it kind of paints us all in a certain light. So I don't know how to feel about this one. I was, I was disappointed, but I, I feel like I need more information. Yeah. I kind of feel the same way. And it, it sucked because this guy and I have butted heads like 10 times publicly. And, you know, I'm petty as hell. So the first thing I was like, I was like, good for you. But then, you know, you kind of see it and you're like, well, I'm not really down with prosecuting victimless crimes. And I don't really see a whole lot that he did. Amy, what do you think? Well, you know, I I don't have a whole lot more to add than what Jackie just said, because obviously, as I'm reading through the story, you know, the the way they paint him, the first thing they say is that they found 30 guns. So it's like trying to paint him in a certain light and and make him out to look like he's this horrible guy who has all this marijuana marijuana mm-hmm. and drugs and, and 30 guns but then he's only charged with like five gun crimes mm-hmm. you know so so the way that they frame and and paint the story is very unfortunate i i don't have all the facts i i couldn't find everything um in there i was like all right well great he has 30 guns so well yeah i don't even think i know anybody with less than 30 guns so it's kind of it's kind of a weird one <laughs> Um, th- it, it does suck. And, you know, reading through it and uh, again, I'm petty, but I do want to, I do want to represent this in, in the way that I, that I believe it should be. And that's that it doesn't appear that he's really committed a whole lot of crimes here, in my opinion, I, clearly against the law, but are these really crimes? And it goes back to, you know, what, what really should be something that's a jailable offense and stuff like that. So I agree totally with what you said about how they framed this. And, you know, the only gun crimes he got charged with were basically having a schedule one item and firearms which is even more stupid so but didn't he but did okay if he has a schedule one like doesn't he have a license for that i mean like or how do he got his hands how did he get his hands on it you know, i mean like there's so many things that i'm just like this story if i was very low information especially on the gun spectrum and knowing any of these laws and i would read this and i would think oh my gosh this is horrible i look at this story and i'm like Mm-hmm. You know, I, I really would like to know a little bit more before we just absolutely like throw this guy under the bus. But totally. you know, yeah, it's I, just it's just unfortunate. Totally agree, and I I hate how they, they talk about gun suppressors and pieces of silver. <laughs> like, yeah, this is a dude who has some money, and like the whole thing seems a little bit dumb. I don't know what the actual crime that he committed was or why they served a warrant, mm-hmm. but definitely just really really stupid. And the things that people get in trouble for in this country sometimes are ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I think it's such a scary precedent. Anytime we hear stories like this, I think all of us as gun owners, woo, we, we get a little like the hairs on the back of our neck stand up like, oh my gosh, you know, could, are, are we in violation as, as much as we try to do everything legally? Like, are, could they find something that we could be in violation of, you yeah. know, and there's a, there's an element that we want to rally behind people that get charged with stupid crimes like this um, if they really aren't doing anything wrong. But because I think it's a slippery slope. Once mm-hmm. we start um, just busting in people's homes, getting search warrants, take did they take all of his 30 guns? You know, they said they found them. They took the marijuana. Did they take his 30 guns and confiscate those as well? And did they really have legal recourse to be able to do that? I mean, I think it just is a slippery slope. When we start hearing stories like that, and that makes me nervous as a gun owner. Totally 100% agree. And I think, I think honestly, the whole thing seems ridiculous. Uh, whether I like the guy or not, it, he's definitely not being presented in, in a fair way here. Everyone over in the live chat said that since I'm from Colorado, that I must have sold it all to him, but that is not true. <laughs> I'm going to say that right now. Not true. Not true. I have zero weed, so <laughs> don't even try it. 
<laughs> uh, new concealed carry reciprocity bill introduced in the Senate. So we saw this one come out. We saw Feinstein's assault weapons ban of 2019 come out. And then Texas Senator John Cornyn. What? Yeah, it, it does appear like uh, he introduced this kind of uh, to spite that or whatever. I've got some concerns about this. I want to hear from you guys. Either one of you, whoever wants to take it first, fight amongst yourselves. Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess I can start it because, you know, I love Senator John Cornyn. I love Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz was also an author on this bill. At the end of the day, like when I when I sit here and I read this, I think it's great. But then it still says that you still have to abide by the state's laws and some states like you can't carry in certain cities. So to me, I don't really know what this bill, the way that the wording is when I read this, I was like, this doesn't really sound like it's going to do a whole lot. Like, cause it doesn't sound like I can still carry in New York. I probably wouldn't be able to carry in Jersey or Los Angeles. Like I travel to Los Angeles all the time. So, you know, I, I don't know just by the wording that's in this bill. I think, it could be just a political move that they're trying to do to say, hey, we're, we're fighting for reciprocity. But true reciprocity to me is exactly like what it says with, okay, it says, um, you know, the, the driver's license. Mm-hmm. Well, that you still have to abide by their laws and their speed limits. Okay, speed limits are totally different than your gun laws. And magazine you know, capacity laws and other things like that. Like and what? The, and you in approved gun list laws. Like, okay, great. Well, what if I have a concealed carry license in Texas, but my the only firearm I have is not approved in California? I now can no longer carry my firearm in California. So what what did that bill actually do to help me? I know. I think we should just make blanket reciprocity like get rid of these dumb laws. They let us all have our driver's license and that's not even a constitutional right. So they definitely shouldn't be infringing on our second amendment, right? When it comes to us being able to consult carry and protect ourselves. Jackie, I want to hear your thoughts before that. I, I do want to read real quick what this does grant and I hate reading the news, but please uh, everyone who's listening, just uh, let me, let me go with this for a second. It protects fundamental constitutional rights. It allows law abiding citizens to exercise their fundamental right to self-defense while they're traveling or temporarily, temporarily living away from home allows individuals with concealed carry privileges in their home state to concealed carry in any other states that also allow concealed carry. Big red flag for me. (laughs) Treats state-issued concealed carry permits like driver's licenses where an individual can use their home state license to drive in another state but must abide by that other state's speed limit or road laws. Uh, Does not establish national standards for concealed carry. Does not provide for a national concealed carry permit. Does not allow a resident to circumvent their home state's concealed carry permit laws. Respect state laws concerning specific types of locations in which firearms may not be carried and protect states' rights by not mandating the right to conceal carry in places that do not allow the practice. Jackie, take it away. Yeah, when I first saw the headline, I was like, oh, and then I read and I was like, oh. You know, I think I'd like to give the benefit here and think that they're trying to make some concessions in order to try to get it passed and, you know, amongst more moderate to liberal senators or districts. But, yeah, I was... I'm, I'm not really cool with the, the idea that, you know, I'm totally fine here in Tennessee and Kentucky, but like when I go to New Jersey, what am I facing there? Mm -hmm. You know, like, like Amy said, if I go to LA, if I go to Denver, what, how is this impacting me? So, I mean, I, I get why they introduced it and I applaud the effort to try to amongst all the things that are going on, but I think it needed some different wording there. Yeah. To me, I'm like, I already, with my license in Texas, I can concealed carry in like, I don't know, 30 something states, you know, and the states that don't have concealed carry, I already can't carry there. So therefore this isn't national reciprocity. This is, I don't know what this is, but it is not national reciprocity. (laughs) It's kind of trash, honestly. And (laughs) it makes me nervous when they introduce stuff like this after some terrible thing like the assault weapons ban, because if they start trading tit for tat and we lose, you know, we, we lose uh, AR 15s and get this nonsense. I definitely am going to be writing some letters because this, this is not a, this is not a trade that I am willing to make. This is, this is a garbage bill that I'm barely only tangentially interested in at best. You want to, you want to make something that, yeah, I don't even know. I, I'm not even sure where I was going with that. It just makes me so mad. And I'm so concerned that it got released so soon after the assault weapons ban was, was introduced that it I think just, it was a knee jerk thing. Like it yeah. was like, we need something. So we'll do something instead of taking the time and saying, what do gun owners really need and want? How can we best protect their constitutional rights and ensure something that they can get behind? It was a knee jerk thing. And it, it just wasn't a s- smart move. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if, if they're like, oh, well, we're going to get you this, but we're losing that. That is such a not something I'm willing to trade. It's, it's well, ridiculous. I think that's important then that you're bringing this up because we 
have to call our senators. We have to call yes. our representatives. If we're not happy with this bill, as soon as I read that, I was like, okay, I'm because I, I know that Ted Cruz fights for our second amendment and believes in our second amendment and will fight for it. Um, so that's why when I first read that he like co-authored this bill, I was like, whoa, this is going to be great. And then I read more into it. And I'm like, no way. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not happy with this. And so, you know, if you're not happy with it, start calling your representatives and let them know that you're not happy with this, that you're not going to take this in exchange for the assault weapons ban to not be passed. We're not doing that. Yeah. And, you know, so they they listen when enough people start standing up and saying something about it. Yeah. And, and it's got a great name, Constitutional Carry Reciprocity. I mean, like a great name, awful content. And we got to be cautious. Like we as gun owners have mm-hmm. to be thinking, critically thinking individuals that will read into it and, and not get behind something that's just written absolutely, extremely poorly. Absolutely. I will say that because, you know, we, we see this a lot of times um, with – headline leftists that just want to read a headline and jump into it. We want to be above that. Like as, as people that believe in the constitution, I do think it's important that we critically think you don't just read a headline and get excited about something and start spreading it all over social media until you really know what the content is, the meat of the story, because I think we need to have an extra level of responsibility when it comes to this. If we truly do want to defend and protect the second amendment, Mm -hmm. we have to know the facts. We have to know what's in these kind of bills and we have to to know it so that we can combat this re- craziness that's happening when people try to come at us only with headlines. Yeah. Don't let them fool you with candy folks. Make sure yep. you yeah. make sure you look and make sure there's no needles in it or razor blades or whatever it happens to be. Uh, let's move down just a little bit. Should paramedics be allowed to carry firearms? This comes to us from concealednation.org. And, uh, you know, paramedics were shot at while responding to a call in Sarasota, Florida. They, it was a fake call. They, they got there and the people said, no, we didn't call for anything as they started to walk back to their ambulance and got inside. A man with a hoodie fired several shots at them, didn't hit the paramedics, but did hit the door. This is near and dear to my heart. Uh, medical is something that I'm very interested in. I travel the country and teach it. And I, I think that paramedics should be, um, I, some of my closest friends are, are paramedics and medics and EMTs and things like that. And they walk into these situations with no way to defend themselves, with no uh, body armor protection. Uh, that stuff exists. It is out there. We need these local uh, departments and agencies to really, really get involved. Jackie, I'm going to hit you with this one first. Um, yeah, so this one's near and dear to me, too, because my dad is a paramedic. And uh, my dad is also a concealed carrier, but uh, hasn't been able to do that because the department restricts uh, the ability to conceal carry. So... You know, I've heard the horror stories. I've heard the the calls that my dad has rolled up on where he has been shot at, where the police have been called, and they've been bunkered down in the back of the ambulance just kind of waiting. And so it just confounds me that paramedics, you know, in, in certain areas aren't allowed to conceal carry, aren't allowed to protect themselves because we allow police officers to do that. We expect police officers to, but firemen and paramedics are also EMS. They're also going into unpredictable situations. They're also going into quickly uh, evolving situations. So it just makes sense to me that we should allow them or they should be able to conceal carry and protect themselves while they're doing their job. Yeah. Very well put. Amy? Um, you know, I, I'm going to play the um, ignorant civilian here because I actually had no idea that the, that the department wouldn't allow them to carry. Um, my, my question when I was reading the story actually was, well, what if as a private citizen, they have their license to carry? Can they carry? Very so often. The department no. won't let them carry, huh? Yeah. That's really unfortunate because they are some of the first responders on a scene. What if they roll up and there's still an active shooter situation that's going on? And so what happens then now you have forfeited your right, even as a private to defend your life mm-hmm. and to not be able to protect yourself. I don't know what the reasoning is for the department not allowing that, but I would even think just on a private citizen level, if you have a concealed carry license, why can't you carry it and protect yourself? Jackie, I don't know about you, but I know for the people here, it's a, it's a um, liability and insurance purposes. Mm-hmm. They, they, w- they wouldn't even be able to get insurance for the ambulance service. And don't forget that most ambulance services are private contractors to the cities, towns and localities there. So they are not even working under the umbrella of public agencies and things like that. So it's a big concern. And not only that, but you know, they're there. It's basically kind of the lowest bidder type situation uh, here in Colorado Springs. We we're kind of have ambulance stuff going on where we're kind of changing contracts in between two separate companies. We've had American medical response forever. And now we're getting some other company that drives around like little blue 
uh, smart cars or something. I don't even know really what they are. And it is, you know, a case of trying to save this money. So when you are one of the lowest bidders and you're putting in these contracts for cities and towns to be their ambulance service, and there's no money in their budget to provide body armor for medics and things like that, they're, they're, they're never going to get it that way. So, you know, we as citizens could supply that, I guess. But I, I don't think that – I think that even a lot of places, they would be nervous about allowing them to do that because people would think that it's threatening. And mm-hmm. and I think that's also just a load of malarkey. It's, it, it's crazy. But, yeah, I, I think they should, personally. I think that we need to get them protected. We had a story on the show not too long ago where – I don't remember exactly where it was, but this agency had gotten, like, a big, huge armored ambulance – since they're a lot of the first responders, especially in situations that could be mass killer situations and things like that, they, they're able to roll in this big armored vehicle, pick people up, treat people on the fly, and uh, take care of themselves and, and their casualties like that. And I, I think it's all good. Yeah. All right. Next story. Lafayette, Indiana. Police officer discovers that he didn't keep his, what is it, booger, ho- booger hook off the bang switch. Uh, friendly fire isn't friendly. This one comes to us from Defense Maven. I think most of us have probably seen that. But what happened is uh, they, they went in serving a warrant or something like that. And as they were fleeing from an aggressive dog out the door, he accidentally shoots her in the back. His partner, that is, shoots her in the back. Pretty terrible. Kind of a lot of training mistakes and other stuff that, that go on. Like, I don't want to armchair quarterback the guy. Clearly mistakes were made. Clearly he's going to have to deal with the repercussions of that. But, Amy, what are your thoughts on this as a whole? Well, my thoughts on it. Whenever I read stories like this, I try to put myself in the situation and start thinking critically through it. Like, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did he have his firearm drawn? You know, like, I think there's a, there's a lot of things and have it drawn in the direction when they're running away from the, running away from the dog. You know, like, we just don't know. Like, we don't know everything that's going on in there. It's a very unfortunate thing. You know, I, I am very, very to, I mean, very slow to criticize law enforcement and what they do because I, I'm not law enforcement. And I think a lot of times we as citizens who've never been in that situation can jump to conclusions very, very quickly. Um, so I'm the last to criticize it. I like to know all the facts before I jump to conclusions. And really the only thing I, I, I have to say is, is this is just sad and it's unfortunate and, and it happens. And I, I hope that they kind of walk through it. I hope he starts playing through in his head. What could I have done different? What did I do that got me in this situation? And then hopefully he learns from that and it doesn't happen again. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, being chased by a dog, like I get it, but if you, if you shoot competition at all and you know, the RO yelling at people to keep their finger out of the trigger guard while they're moving, it becomes like second nature pretty dang quick, especially when you're risking a, a DQ in that situation or, you know, killing a good person in this one. Jackie, what do you think? Yeah, you know, I hate to armchair quarterback any situation that I'm not directly involved in because I don't know the dynamics and I don't know the history of the person involved. But, you know, just watching the video, to me, I was like, okay, well, he drew on an aggressive dog, which, you know, he didn't know what was going to happen, but why did the gun go off? You know, your finger shouldn't be on that trigger and definitely shouldn't be on that trigger when you're facing your partner as you're running away. (laughs) That just kind of seems like uh, bad juju, if you will. But, you know, I, the, luckily, the officer that was shot is okay. She's recovering. So I guess the good news in all of this is it wasn't a deadly incident. Yeah, definitely. But hopefully the department reviews their tactics, maybe gets some extra training, you know, hopefully works with their with their officers on, you know, ensuring good handling even in stressful situations. Well, I think that's something a lot of people probably don't even know. Um, for a lot of departments, they don't. They don't have a lot of money to pay for this ongoing training. A lot of these officers, once they go through the, you know, their basic training and stuff, they have to pay to mm-hmm. do a lot of their training. And so, you know, we put a lot of value in the lives of our officers. And I think it's great and it, and it should. But a lot of times, especially when it comes to people that have their concealed carry license, they actually do a lot more training than these police officers are able to to do. And, you know, and I don't think a lot of people actually know that and, and understand that these mistakes can happen because our departments don't have the funding that they need to truly train for these high stress situations um, that they could potentially be facing. It's very expensive and they don't have it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Someone in chat said, I will say this story shows that police need more training, just like you guys both said. I think everyone here is in agreement. 
this next one, I, I, I try not to talk about medical too much. I know, I'm like, I know I'm passionate about it, but I don't think everyone else is. But gang shooting at a Utah mall shows the importance of medical gear and training. Uh, this, it, it basically happened. Uh, 11, 12 people involved in the fight. Someone draws, draws a heater, starts busting caps in people. Uh, some innocent people get hit. A male and a female are outside of the mall, just kind of like as bystanders and normal everyday citizens get involved. They, they broke out of the, the, they broke out of that cycle where they just froze and didn't know what to do. My, I don't know if you guys have seen the video, but my, my first thought here is that there's a guy, uh, you know, sh- really short haircut, uh, using a belt as a tourniquet. We get, we could talk all day about improvised tourniquets and how, and their efficacy and stuff like this, but he was calm. He kept them calm. He did a great job. He put that pressure on. Was it enough to completely occlude blood flow? Don't know, but just did a great job. Then they, they got another tourniquet or another belt on the, on the other guy. It makes me think a couple things. A, let, let's all carry tourniquets around with us because that's the smart idea. Let's all get trained to carry tourniquets, but it doesn't necessarily matter if you don't always have the correct equipment. It's pretty easy to have one. But if you just have a little bit of knowledge and the cool to deal with the situation, I think it's pretty, pretty, um, required in today's society. Amy? I was really impressed watching this video. A, how calm the victims were. Mm-hmm. Um, but then also how calm everybody else was. I just, I mean, I've never been shot, but I can't imagine that if I had been, I would be that calm. I would hope that I would be. Uh, but you know, I did start to sense a theme here with the stories that you chose that the, the medical aspect is very important. And I think for me, I don't focus enough on that. And I know I'm not alone in that when watching this video, it did strike me. And I said, I probably need to get some training on it because I, one of them, I think was trying to bust out a tourniquet and they said, no, 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 don't put it there. You need to put it here. Yes. And, well, they got really lucky that they had somebody there that knew that and was able to assess the situation and, and help them. And I would want to be that person. And I don't think I would be qualified right at this point to be able to do that. So it made me want to up my game a lot. Yeah, I think it's hugely important. Um, Jackie, what do you think about this whole story? Uh, well, I'm a, I should clarify, I'm a BLS instructor with the American Heart Association. So I geek out on medical stuff. <laughs> um, Did we just a- become best friends? We became best friends. Oh my God. <laughs> Let's do karate in the garage. Uh, <laughs> oh, goodbye, everybody. We're going to talk medical. Um, but no, I'm a huge, huge advocate of CPR first aid training. And I think to Amy's point, a lot of people in the gun community don't put it at a high priority. And it absolutely is. It goes hand in hand with your firearm training and should, because, you know, while you may have wonderful gun handling tactics and, and you may be safe, you can't guarantee that, you know, you're not going to be caught in a situation like this with a, with a shooting event out in the open or even at the range. You know, someone mm-hmm. is reholstering and pops their leg. So knowing how to respond, knowing how to do it in a calm manner, and that comes from confidence. That comes from knowing what to do. You're not going to freeze if you know what to do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, getting that training and tourniquets, tourniquets, tourniquets. They're not that expensive. You can throw them in your purse. There are even companies now like LAG Tactical that make tourniquet holsters. I have one and I carry one because they are so Mm -hmm. important. They are so important. So get the training, splurge a little bit on, on a turn, a good tourniquet, understand how to use it. And, uh, yeah, I I completely agree. And one other thing that I, that I think people should definitely focus on is, uh, in, in my class, we, we talk about the, you know, phases of care, which are direct threat, indirect threat, and then evacuation. And we only do certain things under direct threat because the possible engage, re-engagement of a threat or re-engage or engagement of a new threat. And mm-hmm. I think that that was the one thing that drove me nuts about the video. Like I, I don't want to armchair quarterback and they did awesome, but I wish they would have gotten out of the line of fire away from glass windows, not mm-hmm. had their backs to the unknown. Just things like that because this is a gang shooting. This is people just getting hit by random bullets from people who are fighting in a mall. And we all know how malls are laid out and things like that. There's clearly – they could have at the very minimum had their backs to concrete something while they tre- while they treated and also paid attention for engagement of possible new threats. Wow. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. I, lo- I love seeing stuff like that. I, this video is already now in my class just because I <laughs> thought it was so great. And, uh, yeah, can't say enough good things about it. Moving into I'm offended. I'm going to cover one story from here. Oregon lawmakers want to require gun owners to obtain permits. Oh, I don't even know where, but there's a whole lot of things that come here. It's the brainchild of student activists connected to the movement that grew out of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas high school in Florida, where a shooter killed 17 people nearly a year ago. It grew out of a meeting that he and another, uh, 
senator or whatever had last year with roughly 300 Oregon students following the Florida shooting. Let me just go through a couple of these things here. The sweeping legislation. Oh, there's another thing I want to read. Any opportunity for conversation around these controversial topics is really important. It's really important message that we listen to the students about what it's like to go to school right now. The sweeping legislation would also require people to undergo background checks before purchasing or sharing ammunition and would limit ammunition purchases to a 20 rounds within a 30 day period. Although people could purchase and use unlimited ammunition at shooting ranges, it would ban magazines that hold more than five rounds of ammunition. It would require people to securely store their guns and report the loss or theft of a firearm to law enforcement within 24 hours. And anyone who uh, ignores it could face severe penalties. Let's see if you, if you possess a firearm without a permit, it's a fine up to $6,250 and sentenced to as much as 364 days in jail. Ridiculousness, Amy. Unreal. Like there's so much that's wrong with this bill because we all know I'm preaching to the choir that these rules that they want to put on the books are going to do absolutely nothing to stop a crazy person from getting a firearm, shooting up a school, causing harm to other people. We know that. I mean, this is the same thing that we've been preaching over and over and over again. And so I, the only people that these laws hurt are law abiding citizens. The ones who are going to go through this step. I am firmly opposed to anything that makes it harder for law abiding citizens to get a firearm. And these laws do just that. It puts the single mother in harm's way. It puts the um, woman. I'm a huge advocate for the second amendment because of women's rights and keeping women safe. I mean, I want to keep all of us safe, but let's talk about the women who have stalkers who have domestic abuse, domestic violence going on in their house. These put restrictions restrictions on them that are unnecessary and really put them in harm's way because we all know at the end of the day, criminals don't abide by laws and they're going to go get ammo from a neighboring state. They're going to go get, they probably already have lots and lots of ammo anyways. They're going to get a gun from a neighboring state. Like they're, this is dumb and it doesn't do any anything but hurt the law abiding citizens who actually may need to defend and protect themselves. So yeah, stupid. It is. I agree. Jackie. Yeah, absolutely ridiculous. Um, I had a few points out of that when I was reading the article. The first is they say that we should listen to the Parkland kids, and I'm not saying we shouldn't. They did experience something very tragic, and I think that students have a voice in this too. But we're going to completely disregard gun owners in this. Like, if we're going to listen to one group, I think it's important to listen to other groups too and and take considerations from all sides to, you know, if we're going to enact gun laws especially that affect gun owners. It's only fair that we hear out them too. Right. The other thing that I saw in this was I'm just seeing a bunch of unenforceable laws. Yeah. Like how are you going to enforce this? You're creating more paperwork and more stuff for law enforcement who are already overtaxed as it is with just the the usual work that they have to do. How are you going to make sure that no one, like Amy said, j- jumps over state lines and buys ammunition? What stops that? Are we going to go door to door? Um, I just... It just, it didn't make any sense. Aside from just being terrible, it just didn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. I was like, okay. Uh, I mean, these are, these are really weird and arbitrary things. Um, no more than 20 rounds in a 30 day period. Like, okay, well, competition shooting is dead forever in Oregon and hunting. Well, and hunting. I guess that, the, yeah. I guess that the five people that could get shot with the five round magazine aren't really that important anyway. So I guess, I guess we can lose five lives. Like, if they're worried about mass shootings, I mean, it's just dumb. Magazine capacity bans and limitations are just stupid because also it doesn't say that you can't have 25 round magazines in your belt. And I guess you could just reload a lot. And then you're, if you're going to cause harm to people, you're going to cause harm to people. You're going to find a way to do it. You're going to use a kitchen knife or a fork or whatever you're going to use. Like, this doesn't stop the, the root of the issue, the heart of the issue here. Yeah. And I also find it interesting that, okay, this is going on in Oregon, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and they're listening to the people in Florida. So like they're making state laws for their own people based off of people advocating for another state. Like that just, oh. that just doesn't make sense to me. Well, yeah. So th- it came out of that. And then they, the lawmakers from Oregon had a meeting with 300 Oregonian students. Ah, gotcha. Yes. Okay. But All right. I mean, All right. it doesn't make any more sense. Like, look, I'm going to keep it real for one second here. I raised four kids. I'm actually surprised that they didn't like just drown in soda or something when they were teenagers. Like kids are basically idiots. I, I, I'm i sorry. Like mine turned out really great. They're amazing adults. But as kids, they were idiots that I honestly, I was like, you're honest. You're, you're going to just fall down some stairs. 
and because you don't pay attention to anything. And I, I'm sorry, like when I was a kid, I was an idiot. And I don't think kids should be guiding our public policy. Like I want to listen to them. I want to hear what their concerns are so that we as adults can apply this critical thinking that I keep talking about and things that actually make sense and will actually change their lives and do some good for them. I am so sick of people like, well, the kids, you know, the kids need this. Mm -hmm. Uh, The worst thing that ever happened to the Parkland kids after this was that they got what they wanted and they had to wear clear backpacks and things like that. And they lost all their sense of privacy. And then they complain about that too. Like that's the kind of thing (laughs) that us as adults need to pay attention to, like listen to the kids, hear the kids, but don't let the kids guide our public policy and our national agenda. Yeah. Concur. (sighs) Sorry. Sorry. I am, I am like on a roll tonight. Full out of news segment. <laughs> you picked a lot, man, that fired all of us up. I mean, this was, I a, the, like I said, this was a big week in guns. Ugh. So full out of news segments, some crazy stuff. You guys pick stories. Amy, uh, what story did you pick? <laughs> well, I, I went back and forth between this and the crazy lady at the Walmart. Yes. Um, and I, I just, I don't even know why I picked this story, but it was about a man who um, was drunk and decided to shoot at a deer, but missed the deer completely and shooting a woman in the back of the head. Ah, Awful. Like, it's just, I think mostly I was drawn to this because it's really bizarre. Um, but also, you know, it's another great reminder that alcohol and firearms just Oh, you can drink after you shoot, but it's not a great idea to mix the two. And, you know, because we are all supposed to be big advocates for safety when it comes to firearms, you know, stories like these, again, I think put a negative light around firearms. Um, we know that it's important to not drink and shoot. And so this was a very, very sad, unfortunate story, but again, highlights the importance of being, if you're going to be a gun owner, we need to do it the safe and responsible way. And we need to be big advocates for that. When we hear dumb stuff like this, we need to call it out. You know, I I think that guy should be prosecuted uh, to the fullest extent that they possibly can. And, you know, I hope that this doesn't happen again because it's really, really sad. We have the responsibility for every round that leaves our, leaves our guns. And this is that case. Exactly. When I'm hunting, like That is one of the main things that I worry about is making sure that I know my target when what lies in front and behind it. Jackie, what do you think? Yeah, I think, I think gun ownership comes with responsibility. And if you can't be responsible, then you either need to get some training to get there or you need to figure something else out because you are responsible for every bullet that leaves that chamber and you need to know what you know, which target is, what lies beyond, you definitely shouldn't be drinking. Like that's just, that's just a bad idea. So yeah, it's unfortunate. I'm glad the, the lady, you know, didn't, she didn't lose her life in it. Right. No, No, she, last I read, she was okay. Thank God. That's Um, good. But yeah, I don't think anybody wants to be on the receiving end of an idiot that was drunk and shooting a gun at supposedly so a deer. Mad. Yeah. So oh. mad. Not even deer season. I mean, <laughs> I let's talk about all the things that were wrong with this story. Uh, this is that same lady that was on Bumble, I think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was her boyfriend. Uh, Jackie, what's your story? Uh, so I did the crazy woman at Walmart. Yes. What I'm going to say is living her best life. Here. <laughs> I know. So it was in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. Uh, officers responded to a woman driving around the Walmart uh, parking area in one of the electronic uh, scooters drinking wine from a Pringles can. So great. So great. It's so great. I read this and I'm like, who hasn't wanted to a drink in Walmart? Every time I go, I'm like, and I need something here and be like still one of those electronic scooters and just to put it all together and then try to like drink out of a Pringles can. Like I like her problem solving. I yeah. just, I'm on board with that. I don't think she should have been banned. I think they should have been like, come work for us. Help us create cool Pringles themed products. Yeah, uh, uh, even I though her for their marketing because she just brought a lot of attention to <laughs> yes. that Walmart. <laughs> One thing that I was really impressed is she was driving that motorized cart around for like three hours. <laughs> three how, hours. Did, <laughs> how did the battery last that long? Like some super battery yeah. at Walmart. That is awesome. I hope she didn't spend a lot of money on the wine because that salty Pringles can probably did not enhance the flavor at all. It, the 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 pa- her palate. I'm hoping this is not very sophisticated and and wanting nice wine. Yeah. So. If there's any smart wine con- companies out there, all you need to do is get some Pringles cans. You know, clearly without the Pringles branding, and just start selling wine in them, guys. This is uh, it's yeah. a billion Genius. dollar idea. Genius idea, Sean. Look, I come up with this all day. This is no problem. 
<laughs> that is funny. So anyway, I'm trying to figure out how I can actually do this and not get arrested. <laughs> Or not get banned. Banned <laughs> I don't, from Walmart. Uh, there's like a hundred Walmarts in town. I don't care if I get banned from one. <laughs> On to the next one. Yeah, exactly. I'll just wear a mustache. Yeah. It, it'll be fine. They'll never know. All right. You know, that'll do guys. Uh, that'll do for all the stories. Actually. I, I do want to talk to you guys about all the stuff you're doing and where people can find you. And uh, Amy, I'm just going to start with you. Cool. Awesome. Um, well, right now, you know, our, our biggest focus is we are just growing Alexa. If you're not familiar with what Alexa Athletica is, we are an active carry wear brand that allows women to conceal carry in their active wear. So we've got built in holsters in our leggings and then the tops and jackets are all designed to, they don't actually have, uh, conceal carry pockets in them, but they are designed to work cohesively with the leggings to conceal whatever it is you want to conceal carry. Cause let me tell you, as a lady, it is very hard not to print, um, and yet still look like you have your womanly physique and not have to wear these baggy oversized clothes. I mean, so we put a lot of thought into our designs and our styles and everything. We just want women to stay safe and stylish. So you can check us out at uh, alexoathletica.com. We're on Instagram at alexoathletica, Facebook at alexoathletica, all the good social media places. Um, you can find us there. And then obviously got the podcast going on. If you've not subscribed to that, would love you, would love to. If you've got a lady in your life that wants to hear about lipstick, uh, recommendations and firearms. We are your go-to girls. So you can go check us out on iTunes at not your average gun girls. And I think that about does it. So awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Now, Jackie, shot show coming up for all of us. What you've been doing, where can people find you? And what have you written about lately? Um, what I've been doing is trying to unbury myself from all the emails, as I'm sure you know, get like yes. an avalanche of them and trying to figure out what I'm actually going to cover. So, uh, still in the process of that, we'll see. Writing wise, it's all shot show focus right now. It's all product, uh, news, product announcements. So just keep it tuned to guns.com for all that good stuff. Um, working on a couple of reviews, actually working on the Alexo Athletica crop pants. Oh. review for kinsillcarry.com. So hoping to drop that soon. Very excited about that Unpaid one. review, everybody. <laughs> she just threw that on me tonight that she is reviewing my I pants. Did. So. <laughs> I did. Um, as far as where you can find me, best place is Instagram, micro Jackie, J-C-K-I. No E. There's never an E. Um, <laughs> that's the best place to look me up. I'm on Facebook too. Write for guns.com on a daily basis. You can also check me out at Shooting Sports USA and kinsillcarry.com. So awesome. Really appreciate you guys uh, coming on the show and joining me tonight. I uh, hope it was enjoyable for you. I know the listeners are absolutely just going to love it. And uh, guys, check out all the, all the things. These, these are the women of our industry and they are doing a fantastic job and kicking a ton of <laughs> Sorry, Kenny. I know I'm not allowed to say that, but dang it. I can do it sometimes. I can do it when I want to. But guys, check out our advertisers. Second Call Defense, you can find them at firearmsradio.tv slash SCD. They are basically, well, not even basically, they are self-defense insurance. What happens after you pull that trigger? None of us really know that. Clearly, I haven't shot anybody, so uh, I've never had to, and I'm really glad, and I hope I spend the rest of my life. But on the off chance that it does happen, it's incredibly affordable, and they kind of kick into action. You don't have to come up with money for bail, bond, criminal, or civil trials, damages, anything. They cover it all. Wow firearmsradio.tv slash scd we also love the patriot patch company patriotpatch.co and guys i want to hear i want to hear from you leave some reviews if you like the show leave reviews in itunes facebook whatever if you don't i want to know about it like tell me what you do tell me what you don't like i own the firearms radio network and i want to hear from you my email address is sean s-h-a-w-n at firearmsradio.tv any ideas whatever you have you, you want to just yell at me for ruining everything i want to hear that too so sean at firearmsradio.tv Thanks to the ladies for being on the show. This Week in Guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and is a production of the Firearms Radio Network. And I'll talk to you all, not next week, but the week after.